So one of the goals of this exhibit was to do something a little bit different, a little bit fresh. So I, my co-curator is Roger Mandel, and he is the co-founder of DATMA, which is Design Art Technology Massachusetts, which is a citywide celebration of wind and wind energy. So when Roger and I started working on the show, I was doing research on climate and innovation in Dutch history, and it turns out there was a little ice age that is a huge focus of scholarship at the moment during this time period all over the world, but particularly in Europe and how it affected different cultures and econ economics of Europe. And what was very interesting to me is there are several books written specifically on Holland during this time period, during this climate variation um, fluctuations. So the Little Ice Age is explained in this panel. Um, I worked with a scholar from Georgetown University named Dagomar de Groot, and his name is on that panel. His book will be for sale in the store if it's not already, but he wrote a book specifically on the frigid Little Age um, of Holland and how the Little Ice Age may or may not have affected um, industry, commerce in that time period. So, it's not the only focus of the show, but it was a unique and fresh perspective to take on these particular paintings, and there are other pieces in that as well. So the Little Ice Age was really lasted for about 400 years, but the period, the greatest period of fluctuation was between the 16th and the 18th century when these paintings were created. So basically what that means is what it means now is that climate fluctuated dramatically. There were severest winters recorded in human history, and some of the worst summers recorded in human history. It really went from about 1500 to 1850. So the last painting in the show on, in this room is a Von Beest from 1855. So I'll walk through that in a second. Um, but what was really unique about Holland is they had an unbelievable maritime culture already, really fabulous ship designers, obviously a deep connection to the sea. So what Holland was, they were in the right place at the right time, and they had the right people to maximize the benefits of these climate fluctuations. So for example, they weren't an agricultural society, they were an industrial uh, maritime trade society. So with great drought, they already had resources and cash crops from the Baltic Seas, which is up you know, north and to the that way um, from Holland. So they really controlled that trade and were able to get resources to stockpile during the particularly bad weather and also to trade with other cultures. So other countries, particularly in Asia and Southern Europe, um, had terrible droughts and famine and the Black Plague and a lot of things are now being attributed to these climate variations that just were um, for people who had the bad infrastructure in the wrong place at the wrong time, just added that extra challenge that made industry agriculture much more difficult. Holland was controlled by the Habsburg kings of Spain at the time, which was Philip II in the time period that we're talking about, right when the Habsburgs were broken, um, Holland was breaking from them in independence. So largely Catholic um, uh, and there's a you know, long politics to it that perhaps is a little bit out of scope, but the, basically the most important information is the Dutch were starting to revolt against the Spanish kings in the late 16th century. So they were becoming independent. They were a very unique political structure in terms of almost more like a de democracy or almost more like the United States where there were really various states governed by individual groups as a republic. So it wasn't anymore this big... Um, dictatorship like it had been with the Habsburg kings. So it, in um, the late 16th century, they declared independence. Um, there were all kinds of revolts going on in different parts of Holland, um, revolted at different times. But as a whole, in the um, mid 17th century, they were completely broken from Spain. So when you see some of our paintings um, have a whale on the Dutch flag, it was illegal to fly a Dutch national flag during the Habsburg rule. So they got around it by putting a whale on it and saying it was a whaling flag um, as whalers. So some of the paintings you see like that one become very national pride with lots of big Dutch flags flying. Okay, so I wanted to point out these couple of works because these relate both to the Little Ice Age but also to some of the key pieces in our collection. But this is a beautiful piece of a whale stranding above the Hague, so on the west, northwest coast of Holland, a little bit above the Hague. 
Um, there was a known sperm whale beaching there, and we have many prints and iterations of the same kind of event. So it's speculation which one this actually is. But typically, like the compa the the other piece we have like this is up in the Bourne building, and it shows public spectacle context of this kind of event where people are in fancy dress and horses and fairs, and it's become this part of their sort of entertainment public spectacle. The other way of looking at this in the context of this show is that according to um, marine biologists and climate environmental study um, professors we've been consulting with, during the Little Ice Age, because of the warming of the seas in the summers, so that it wasn't only, is obviously a cell variation, not freezing to death all the time, but also really hot, um, sperm whales tended to come up farther north than they had been, uh, going along these sort of sandy, shallow coasts of Holland, and they're big animals, and they couldn't get out, and there was a record number of strandings of sperm whales during this period of time. So some people um, saw this as an omen, you know, sort of, evil omen or bad omen that God was punishing them, sending them a sign because they were manipulating the landscape of Holland. So Holland ha is just filled with water naturally. I mean, it's, you know, most of it's below sea level, so dike systems and windmills and damming systems and creating arable land was obviously a huge part of making the land livable. Um, so some people thought that this was a sign from God that they were going to be punished for changing nature. And other people said, well, no, because he wouldn't have given us these brains to be able to do that unless he expected us to do it. So there were different sides, and there's some wonderful passages in some of the books I'll leave out for you guys um, in the volunteer room, including from Simon Shama, has a whole um, chapter on whales and strandings in Holland, which is really fascinating. So it's cool to look at it from that perspective. The reason I, I didn't steal the one from Bourne because that has more of a festival atmosphere to it. And this one also has all these fabulous sailboats of different types in them. So um, this other painting on my left, just so you know, part of the process of the show was also reframing, conserving pictures that we had in the collection so that they're really presentable in a whole different level. So you might remember this had a hideous oak frame upstairs, and one of our donors came in and said, I'd really like to take off that 1960s frame from this picture, and we put something more appropriate to the time period. Um, so this is a modern reproduction custom frame of what might have been on this painting originally in Holland, a much more stylistically appropriate. So I had Mystic Seaports um, master rigger Matt Otto analyze this painting as well as various other uh, marine historians, including Michael Dyer. Um, but Matt has rigged historic ships his entire life, and I had him look at the rigging of this one. Um, this artist, Abraham Matthews, actually went on whaling voyages. He was a merchant um, as well. He went to sea many times. He's very familiar with ships, and apparently the rigging on this is exquisite. Uh, Matt said there isn't a single thing he sees that's wrong with this painting in any way in terms of how the rigging is put together. So it's, there's a certain level, kind of like the panorama, a certain level of authenticity that was expected by the Dutch clientele because one in ten men were at sea at any given time during the Dutch Golden Age, sort of 16th, 17th century. So if you looked at a painting and it was all screwed up, it was typically something you'd say, well, it's not authentic, and of course, I'm not going to buy it. This is a larger scale painting which might have been commissioned for a merchant's office, a whaling agent's office. Um, this painting's a little bit... Um, it's... Uh, sort of right during the beginning of the height of Dutch whaling, which was really over by the end of this century. Um, these are flout ships and boot ships, and there's some argument of what that little boat in the corner is actually called. I've had three different answers on it, but they're all, um, these were all used in Dutch whaling. So when commercial Dutch whaling started, there were no commissioned whaling ships. They would repurpose merchant ships for that purpose. And this is a flout ship I mentioned. Um, that It has this funny deck shape. It's the same kind of boat that's in the case on the other side of the gallery. So you were taxed on the air surface area of your deck so they made the decks very small, and the cargo's really wide. So that's why they're so funny looking. Um, so the decks were enormously, incredibly small for the size of the boat. Another thing to look at is um, these stern paintings were used as a pictorial name rather than the written word. And you'll see that in most of the paintings, some of them have the name also written on them, and there are various theories for that. 
probably commissioned by the owner of the boat who wants to make very sure that you know this is mine. Um, this is typical of a lot of paintings that you see in every museum. Um, the people who pay for them typically dictate a little bit what they'd like to have in it. So these were probably more for illiterate sailors um, out at sea to be able to instantly recognize the ship that they were coming across and who owned it, um, rather than having a written word that they wouldn't be able to understand. So there's some very, if anyone has theories on these pictures, I would love to hear it because we've been racking our brains trying to figure out what this scene is. It seems to be a man um, greeting someone coming off a ship. Could be kind of a Jonah Christ symbol, don't really know. This one is a tower with angels. And then this seems to be a female warrior goddess, but we're not really sure. So if you have any thoughts, please let us know. One thing to mention about this too, um, as I talked about authenticity, many of these artists, and you'll see which ones they are, went to sea. It's pretty obvious which ones knew and which ones didn't know what was going out on the oceans. But this picture in particular has really incredible colors and the clouds are really beautiful, um, and he did have certainly rigging knowledge of the seas. Um, there is a panel around the corner. As you're looking through the paintings, there have been scientists who are now looking at these types of paintings as evidence of atmospheric and climate change because of the colors of the paintings. I find this enormously problematic um, for a lot of reasons because that's not really orange, for example. Um, it was originally probably bright, bright red, but this is a very old painting. Pigments change over time, um, and also it depends on the trade routes. Some people say, well, those paintings will look a little darker, so maybe it was more wintry. Maybe that's totally true. But at the same time, during this period, there were a lot of interruptions in trade routes for like ultramarine that you got from Afghanistan, at now, the modern day Afghanistan of lapis lazuli, which was a very expensive pigment and typically was only used for royalty and for kings and queens. So when you see the Madonna with a blue robe on, that's the most expensive paint you could possibly use. It's like painting it with diamonds. Um, and with red was very expensive and not until the New World where they found the beetles, um, the cochineal beetles, that it really became a fixed red. It was extremely expensive. Um, the Spanish hid where they got those beetles for a long time. It was like punishable by death if you told people where they came from. So it was really only for royalty and queens. And some pictures, some kinds of pigments do just alter over time. So if you look at Turner's paintings, even Van Gogh's paintings, there were very famous white roses. Um, for years, they were interpreted about purity and the white rose and blah, blah, blah. And then when they did analysis of the paint, they realized originally the roses were pink, but they had faded. So changed everything. <laughs> so it's um, dangerous to overinterpret. So people might ask about that, and there is a Harvard professor I'm trying to get to come here and speak about his project that he's doing on this. But um, there is, so there, it's not to say it's not true, it's just with a caveat that pigments do change sometimes over time. Okay, so this is our tempest wall. And there's a wonderful professor um, coming here named Larry uh, Getty, who's written a book on Tempest paintings. And he actually attributed this painting, um, a PDP monogramist. Um, there are three or four known paintings by this artist in the country, but we don't know his real name. But he does have, there's a little PDP on this flag, and that's how he signed his paintings. So that's how we know they were by the same hand. And of course, they look similar. Um, so during this period of time where climate was variable. There were certainly much bigger storms than there had been historically um, in anyone's memory. So tempest became very symbolic during this period of time, um, either for the wrath of God, for hope, for redemption. Um, so this sort of shows several different iterations of that kind of genre of painting. So this one's my favorite, I think in the show probably. But this was um, a conservation masterwork. So this was so badly damaged, it was lying flat in a box. So it probably hasn't been on display for at least 100, if not longer, years until we had it conserved last year. And, um, and all the paint was there. It was just falling off the panel. So it's an oil on panel. But the details are extraordinary. And I honestly couldn't have really looked deep into it except that we have high resolution photographs of it. Um, so this is a tempest at sea, obviously. I have counted, I think, 10 ships. Some of them are really far in the back and hard to find. Um, 
but it looks like it was painted with an eyelash. It's just exquisitely done. And it's, I mean, for me, I can't see it with the naked eye until we blow it up with high resolution photography, some of it. But my theory with this one is, it's probably the oldest Dutch maritime painting in the country. It's about 1595. And it was painted by a follower of Cornelius Vroom, who was arguably the inventor himself of seascape, naturalistic seascape painting. So this is probably one of his followers based on the style and on the time period. Um, and so it's a tiny painting. It was probably um, for someone's private home because it wasn't on a grand scale. This picture here, and I told you about the Stern painting, so this is a picture rather than words. It's a Madonna and child, and I am pretty positive above that there's a bust of Philip II. And I've looked at many pictures of Philip. I did my dissertation on him, I'm pretty sure. And then there are these captains all standing, or just commanders standing in the back. If you've ever seen the movie Master and Commander, where you know the captain's quarters are, these are probably all of the officers. If any of you are sailors and take a good look at this, there's no way any of these ships are coming out of this. Uh, they're all dragging their sails, and the masts are breaking, and there's really no hope for these boys. And maybe a woman or two, I doubt it. But there is a little ray of hope here in the corner. So my theory is, and anyone is welcome to refute me on this, but the Madonna and Child representing Catholicism and Philip II, and the Dutch fleet under the Spanish rule is going down. And this is right at the time where the Dutch were revolting against the Spanish, but there's a sort of ray of hope that perhaps after the, the Spanish kings are wiped out <laughs> from the Dutch, Dutch Republic, that there'll be some hope of a different future. So it's just one reading into the painting, but definitely look at all these beautiful little sea creatures to point out to people is really beautiful. And then, after, thanks to Michael, looking at this section here, um, it looks like they're actually shark jaws as the, wa as the waves, which it just looks too much like it not to be, in my opinion. But so it's just this sort of ominous, like, raw, like the maw of the ocean is just opening up to suck all these ships down and eat them up. So, um, but... It's fun to point out. And this one does have glass. There are two, piece, two paintings with glass on them. And I did put glass on this one because we just had it conserved. And it's, I keep touching it all the time. I <laughs> just want to make sure that no one else does that. Um, and then this, we obviously, being the Whaling Museum, have a billion prints of Jonah and the whale. So this is one I just thought was really fun because if you look at the ship, it's just stuffed with people. I mean, it's a sort of ship of fools kind of thing. But Jonah, as you know, um, he was given a mission by God. He didn't do it, and then God punished him by sending a tempest. And then once he was... He, thrown overboard. The tempest went away. He was swallowed by the whale. He repented, got spat back out on shore, and then went off and kind of did what God told him to do. Um, so he was redeemed after the scene. But this one, it's just a beautiful piece. It was done um, by a fairly well-known designer who designed 1,600 prints that we know of in Holland. Um, and then this was printed by, uh, I think his name was Crispin the I, in, in Amsterdam, which was the biggest printmaking city in the world at the time. So it's just a really beautiful print of Tempest and Redemption. And then this one, um, there's a, if you want to read more, I have more resources, but one of the traditions in Holland at the time was making a lot of images with classical references. So this actually has a, an excerpt from Ovid um, in the bottom of it. And, um, and I'm trying to think of the quote. It's Tristia from 8 AD that's on here. And this one is really Tempest, and then people sort of the wrath of God, and there really isn't much redemption in that, in that image either. Um, some of these are pretty aggressive. This is a pen painting um, by Whitmont, and one of the, this is an extraordinary type of technique. A better example of the technique is over on the other wall, which I'll show you. But this is done with an oil-based lead paint um, ground that you'd have to let cure for a couple of months, and then you would draw on it with a quill and ink. So if you messed up any part of this picture, it's ruined. So they were very expensive, even in their own day. The Tsar of Russia would come and buy them, and they were extremely collectible and very rare still, incredibly time sensitive. They look like engravings, but they're actually paintings. The detail that you can get, though, um, outside, you can't do this necessarily as a painting as easily as you could with a quill. He obviously was proud of it, because you'll see his signature is right dead center on a piece of driftwood. 
So he was very proud of the fact that he was able to paint this. That certainly is a symbol of many, like the PDP monogramist. Um, this is my painting. Um, the market was very strong for art at the time. There were a thousand known artists at this period. Um, and people would collect paintings from all different walks of life. So you could be the richest guy in town, or you could be the baker, and you would have a print or an original painting. But there was art everywhere. It was very much every man's kind of work. So you'll see in the panel, too, that um, the move shift away, you'll see no, really no religious paintings um, in this exhibit, and there aren't that many really from this time period compared to earlier. So it's more secular work and less religious, less um, looking at royalty certainly, but looking at wealth, ownership, national pride, um, and certainly God and moralism in that sense, but always based in sort of a Dutch landscape, um, which is pretty interesting. Some artists obviously went to sea and some obviously did not. Arguably, um, this artist probably didn't. If you look at the whale in the picture, probably hasn't really seen one. This one is of a real event um, that happened, a conflict between the Brit British and the Dutch at a whaling station, but the artist most likely never saw it in person because the whale looks totally crazy. Um, however, <laughs> Um, other pieces are done, I'll show you on the Bachhausen, he did go to see and very familiar with what whales really looked like. So some things are real events, but definitely not seen by the artist. Some things are composites from prints that we also have in the collection, and this is described on many of the labels. And some were definitely done by artists who, like R. Bradford, probably went to see, took notes, made sketches, and then made a big studio piece um, when they got back to the city. Um, this is one I'd like to point out. Um, it's, a, it's attributed to Bonaventura Peters, who's one of the most important early 17th century Dutch painters. He had a big studio. Um, and his sister most likely painted a picture I'll show you next. I had a, I don't know how many of you guys were here for the opening on Tuesday night, but Bernie Teradash came, who's a very dear friend of the museum. He helped facilitate purchasing this piece. Most of the pictures in here, 99% of them are from the Kendall Whaling Museum. This is one that the museum actually purchased a couple years ago. So Bill Verick of Newport sold it to us. So anyways, Bernie came and wanted to talk about the acquisition because he was a very important part of it. Um, and I'd said all this stuff about the show, and so had Roger Mandel, and we were talking about Dutch art, blah, blah, blah. And Bernie came in and he said, this used to belong to Mr. Nick. And he had financial trouble, he had to sell it back to Bill Verica, blah, blah. And I, so I got up afterwards and I said, he means Nicolas Cage. <laughs> so it did belong to Nicolas Cage, and I thought, oh, this might be che you know, sort of cheesy to mention. Everybody just periled in here, where's that painting? That's all they wanted to see was what did Nick Cage used to own? So this is his, uh, was in his um, office in Middletown, Rhode Island, and then when he lost all of his money, he had to sell everything off. This went back on the market and we managed to acquire it. So, um, so that's just a little celebrity tidbit on that one. Um, but this is actually a, a Jan Mayen Island. And what I find really interesting about this is he has the Dutch flag, you know, the whaling flag on top and here. And then it has these sort of crazy looking whales, um, this one with a red eye and um, sort of goofy looking. But the landscape of the island is actually really quite identifiable of a very famous volcano in Jan Mayen, which is in the middle of nowhere. It's on the map over there. But it's, um, it did erupt, and it was a major whaling station, but also a port of a lot of um, competition. And there's a little scene here, again, I'm always looking for people to help me figure this stuff out, but it seems to me a part of the painting was cut off. So there are men chasing each other with guns, but you don't know kind of how it ended or exactly what it was. So anyways, there's a little scene that seems to have been cut off. But it's a beautiful piece, and it's new to our collection in the last couple of years. All right, so just to quickly touch on a couple of other Tempest pictures, we looked at the ones on the other side. Um, lots of Wrath of God, lots of things happening. Um, and this picture is quite different. So in our research, we discovered some really interesting connections with things that we'd never noticed before. But first, let me tell you that this is probably done by Katerina Peters, the only picture by a woman in the show. Um, she probably didn't let herself be attributed to the work because it wouldn't have been as marketable for a woman to have painted it at the time. She worked in her brother's studio, Bonaventura Peters, of that other painting I showed you. The reason we think this is Katerina is because this particular style of ship had not been designed by the time her brother died. And she was running the studio with her younger brother. And this is believed to have been by her hand, um, which she just attributed to the studio. 
And there's pretty good evidence for that. But what the other thing that's interesting about this, it is a storm scene, and I was wondering why this ship doesn't have any sails up. Um, and it's, when you look at it with high-res photography or with a magnifying glass, you can see there's actually a little an anchor road here. So there's a little line going in. So it's actually anchored against the storm. It survived the sea. And this, this beautiful Leviathan is sort of funny looking, looks kind of similar to the one in the other painting, uh, but it's behind the ship and it's not any big threat apparently to the scene. We're far away from the rocks. There's a ray of light coming down. There's a nice big Dutch flag, so the world is fine. Um, what, but we did notice too, is there's the Medici lion symbol on the stern. So I thought that was fascinating because I think it refers to this, which is an illustration from a book that celebrated the visit of Maria de' Medici to Amsterdam in 1638. She um, visited after she had been ousted from the French throne, she was the former French queen, but she was still a very, obviously very high royal blood. Um, so there was a book commemorating her visit and um, all kinds of wonderful festivals, water tournaments, ships with fancy ladies and fancy men sort of touring around Amsterdam. There was a floating theater, there were feasts and all kinds of fabulous things going on for her visit. So why would we care about the former queen of France coming to Amsterdam? And she was also a Philip II supporter. So I thought that was really weird. Um, <laughs> but it turns out that Amsterdam was the most powerful city in the province. And they were celebrating the fact that someone of such royal blood would come to Amsterdam and that they were of equally high standing as this woman. So in the book, which is lavishly illustrated, this is only one of a dozen illustrations in this book, the writer actually, he was an orator as well, but he wrote, the quality of her blood and that of her ancestors was equaled by the greatness of the city in trade and the good fortune and happiness of its citizens. So as a way to show that Amsterdam was just as important as Paris, we were just as important as London, this is the most magnificent city in the Dutch Republic. Um, so this is just an interesting connection, even though that was later, it's possible that this would have been done for a private office by someone who either supported her visit or was from Amsterdam and wanted to celebrate the importance of the city. These are just theories, but I think it's a pretty interesting connection to think about. Okay, so this is actually the painting from the cover of Stuart Frank's beautiful book on the Dutch collection. It's by Bachhausen, who is one of the most important Dutch maritime painters and probably one of the most popular of his time. Um, he actually um, met the Tsar from Russia, wanted him to work with him and teach him how to draw. Um, he paid a fisherman to take him out in a tempest so that he could see what the winds and currents were doing in a storm so he would become a better maritime painter. So this is that sort of air of authenticity I was talking about about earlier. It's a spectacular painting. The sky is beautiful. This is probably one of the best whales, if you look carefully, of all the different paintings in the show. He knew what a whale looked like because he did go on three whaling voyages himself. So this is an artist who actually had authentic knowledge of whaling and the seas and of the animals. However, there are some questions, again, that I'd love everyone to think about. There's the weirdest little scene over here. No idea what's going on. <laughs> it's like, it looks like a naked guy, someone on the ground, and someone jumping up and down. No idea what's going on. But the, other than that, there's sort of a whaling scene and the beautiful billowing sails and the rigging again, and this is exquisite. Um, the animals are a little lumpy and funny looking. Maybe he didn't make it to the Arctic, but he certainly knew what whales looked like. And there's a gorgeous golden whale on the stern of this picture, and again, that Dutch tricolor with the whaling flag as well. Um, so this is a gorgeous piece. Um, this was done certainly when the Dutch were already a republic, so they were also allowed to fly the national flag. But this does still distinguish them as whaling ships in the Arctic. Um, in the Arctic, because of the Little Ice Age, also I should mention, bowhead whale behavior changed because they like to congregate near the ice flows, near the edge of the ice. So during the warmer summers, when the ice melted, the, the whales started to disperse. And so that's really when the Dutch went back to sort of a more Basque whaling strategy and less of a whaling station. <clears throat> this picture is the one I was mentioning that I think that this artist was really better trained as a landscape painter and probably didn't go to see too much. These are composites from other prints that we know of in the collection that are on the label. And certainly Mike Dyer has done a lot of research into that if you want to ask him some more questions of which prints. But they look like saber-toothed tigers. They're a little funny looking. The ships are kind of awkward. The whales are lumpy and odd. Um, 
the sky is incredible. I think the sky was done by a landscape painter, someone who actually studied the heavens, you know, and the clouds, and um, and had, had seen them before, <laughs> maybe could step outside. But it seems to me that the composite pictures of these um, are from earlier prints, and the sky is probably from his own study. And you'll see even on a lot of these, the whale spouts are going forward, and they're like giant jet streams of fountains rather than actual um, blows from whales. So this actually leads a lot into, um, in the next room, William Bradford cloud paintings with sort of the connection between here and there, looking at the authenticity of depicting the natural world. All right, so again with climate change, um, this is a piece that we had restored, this watercolor by Jan Moy, and it has a line across the center. I'm not sure if this theory is correct, but Moy's father had gone to the Arctic to whale decades before he painted this piece, but he published a very famous journal about that voyage. There was a lot of evidence, a lot of documentation of a, a phenomenon called ice blink, where the horizon would shift and you sort of lose track of where it was because of the reflection of the light off of the ice. It's possible that depicts that, but I've also read that about some of these pen drawings that the horizons kind of disappear and there are no clouds because that was actually something they were trying to render. I'm not sure if that's true or not, um, but it's something just interesting to think about. This is another pen drawing. It's our most exquisite of this style. It does, this ship's name is Hollandia. You'll see this one actually has a word on the stern. There was no whale ship named Hollandia that we can find any records of from this time period. So it most likely, possibly, was more of an allusion to Dutch nationalism rather than to an actual ship. But again, this is just a theory. But if you see the details on the sternboard and on the sails of this painting, this was just a phenomenal example of this type of work. And I've been trying to see exactly how this technique worked. People are still trying to figure out exactly what tools they were using, but most likely a quill pen and most likely black ink on this oil lead paint. Um, and I just want to show you this one too of Albert von Beest. So this is a fun painting to point out because this connects us to New Bedford. So this is all really Dutch nationalism, maritime history. Albert von Beest came to the US in 1850. He met William Bradford, our own, um, in New York. And then the two of them came up to uh, this area to study together, to paint together. And to me, William Bradford's paintings were very flat and awkward until he met von Beest. And I think that he really taught him the Dutch tradition of maritime painting. Bradford's painting became, paintings became much more fluid, much more focused on naturalism than they had been in the past. So this painting is interesting because it's actually from 1855. So Von Bies was already in the U.S. at that point, but he paints a Dutch scene. So this might have been for some market for Dutch paintings in New York or even up here. But there are little windmills. I mean, it's no question it's Holland with these Dutch ships and the Dutch outfits and all that. But it's a, more of an historic, nostalgic look at Holland. Um, while he was probably living in New York in a studio. Um, so uh, just a fun story about him that's in Mary Jean Blasdale's book, but Von Beast left Holland um, and told his mother to be back in two weeks, and he left with a couple pencils in his pocket and a couple bucks and said, see you soon, I'll be back soon. Went off on a ship and never came home. So he ended up in New York and then died 15 years later. He died when he was about 40. But in the meantime, he met all these amazing artists and he influenced a lot of the painters in this region. So he's a very important connection for Dutch painting to this specific city. And then in the Waddell's president's office, which we don't necessarily need to go into, um, are William Bradford's cloud paintings. So Bradford was a very, um, he was an excellent student of nature, I think after Von Beest. Um, those were done in the 1860s. But very much in the style of the Hudson River School painters who were all studying the skies at the time and writing poetry. There's a fabulous book I'll put upstairs called The Invention of Clouds that talks about the fascination with the atmosphere at that time um, and looking at you know, how are clouds formed and what do they mean and how do we tell what the weather's going to be. Um, but a lot of artists were talking about the authenticity of the, of the skies and how you can't be a landscape painter without understanding the relation between land and, and the clouds. So he really, I think, taught Bradford to be a better observer of nature because of this whole genre of seascape painting from the Dutch Golden Age.